Spring into summer by looking younger. Call Vein Clinics of Hawaii to schedule your free consultation today. Facial and body rejuvenation procedures are designed to help you look and feel your best without breaking your budget. Reduce pigmentation, fine lines, wrinkles, scarring, and stretch marks with minimal invasiveness or side effects. Confused about which procedure is right for you? Call 427-5565 to schedule an appointment or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Aloha Hawaii! It's time for the Vein Clinics of Hawaii radio show. Their team's approach to diagnosing problems and developing solutions and treatment plans are beyond compare. So let's get started with your host of the show, Mike Buck, and medical director, Dr. Randall Julif of the Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Yeah, there you go. You thought you were just going to get like a 30 second commercial. No, no, no. We got a bonus day for you today. Lots and lots of things going on. It seems like it was forever since we last met. Well, it was. It was a week ago. Uh, glad to have you uh, with us, hopefully again, if you're here for the first time. Uh, Dr. Julef is uh, Vein Clinics of Hawaii. He's the medical director. Uh, they are four islands. They're on the Big Island. Started on the Big Island. Uh, unlike most businesses, started on Oahu and expanded the big, to the neighbor islands, he started the other direction. So he's got the island of Maui, Kauai, uh, of course, the big island, and, and uh, here on Oahu is where we record the program. And he's down there in the Alamoana building. We'll talk about that. Um, and, and a lot of things. And I was just talking to Doc off the air saying, I run into a lot of friends that say, how in the world do you talk for an hour a week about veins? And I said, well, because there's way more than an hour a week about things that we can talk about. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm a believer there are a lot of things going on in legs and a lot of things going on with veins and arteries and all of that stuff. Remind people what got you into the specialty of uh, being a venous, a, a vein surgeon. Well, I um, for a, a good number of years, I was doing uh, open heart surgery and uh, what's referred to as peripheral vascular surgery, and that's mm. dealing primarily with arteries uh, in other yeah. parts of the body other than the heart. Um, and uh, and enjoyed that for many years, but uh, it's just been over the last eight or ten years that I've kind of uh, decided to focus a little more completely on uh, veins because, as you say, I mean, it doesn't sound like a huge topic, yeah, but it's but a very, yeah, very extensive yeah. And the the other thing about uh, you know vein disease is that uh, in the said the same can be said for vascular disease also is that uh, it's a very very yeah. common problem a lot of people have it uh, you know when you when you think about yeah. vein disease fifty percent of adults in this country have some significant amount yeah. of what we call venous insufficiency yeah, yeah. and it, it may not drop you but what we really talk about here on the program is quality of life. I mean, whether it be being able to go out and enjoy the sunshine with friends because you're not worried about the, the way your legs look, or maybe you just can't walk for great periods of time without your legs feeling dull and achy. So that's, uh, that's why we jump into it. And I often got confused in the very beginning because just being a, a newbie, a neophyte, I didn't know the difference between a vein and an artery. I do know now that the artery is that big hammer that takes it from your heart and sprays it all over your body. And then the veins have the cleanup job. Um, and you've heard of carotid artery. And, and when that came up, I asked the doc if there was any way we could look into that a little bit. And who knows, maybe even do a show. The carotid artery, you can almost feel it. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's got it. It's always in the neck. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not everybody's heard about the carotid artery. I think a lot of people have, but most people have heard about the jugular vein. Yeah. yeah. And like the jugular punch in the jugular vein. Yeah. yeah. A punch yeah. or a cut or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the, the carotid arteries uh, run very, very close to the jugular vein. Mm-hmm. All of that uh, is going up and down in the neck. Um, and uh, the carotid arteries are, are very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the reason I ask is because I guess you can feel them, mm-hmm. but are they way inside? Because I would think two things that are important. you got that stuff going on in there. They're both major significant importance. You sure don't want them near the surface where they can get damaged. No, you yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, they actually they aren't all that deep, and I, I think that's why um, scary. Yeah, yeah, it was scary, yeah. and uh, you know it's a it's a lethal. Part. If somebody's trying yeah. to hurt you, it's a lethal area. It's sure. not very well protected. You know, most of our uh, mo- most of the significant you know large sort of vessels and nerves throughout mm-hmm. our body are protected in one way or another. You know, either yeah. by ribs or by you know spinal column, et cetera. But yeah, the neck is a particularly vulnerable area. 
Yeah, particularly if you take a look at some of these MMA artists. They might have big necks, but yeah. not anywhere near as big as their biceps, legs, or stomach. You know? No. Yeah. no okay, so, so, so let me ask you this. Um, the carotid artery, from what I understand, uh, is sending the blood into the brain. Right. Okay, so... What what are what are the problem? What what are what kind of disease does that artery get? Because first of all, if you've been listening for a long enough time now, you know when we talk about veins and arteries, the veins are significantly different from the arteries because of these things called valves and other things. Um, I've always thought the arteries to be a meteor, more you know, major sort of a deal. It doesn't have many yeah. moving parts. Right, uh, and you're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. the you know the, the arteries, uh, the wall of the artery is thicker. Uh, there's a little more muscular yeah. kind of uh, cellular layer, uh, and uh, and no, they don't rely on mm-hmm. valves the way the veins do. Uh, the blood flowing through arteries is solely because the heart is pumping and it's uh, you know moving through those different channels. But yeah, the the carotid arteries are the main blood flow to the brain. Right. These. So this is the one we got to really pay attention to. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so those arteries, uh, like I said, are very important. Now, in some people, they're a little more important than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, so the the thing that we get concerned about, the main thing that we get concerned about is alteration of blood flow through the carotid arteries in whatever way. And there mm-hmm. are a number of different things that we'll talk about. Well, but, we, we've seen, for instance, in the veins, we've seen plaque buildup. Uh, usually... Because it can. Can this, can a similar situation happen in an artery? It can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the usual problem. Gotcha. But uh, you know the uh, the thing that we get concerned about with uh, blood flow through carotid arteries is that it can lead to stroke. Mm-hmm. You know, stroke is the main thing. Now, can other other mm-hmm. bad things happen to the carotid arteries? Sure. Uh, but uh, when we talk about uh, arterial disease within the carotid mm-hmm. arteries, the thing that we're trying to prevent. Uh, is uh, a patient or a person having a stroke. Now, there's a couple of different types of strokes. Um, You know, some people have strokes because of uh, arterial problems uh, in one way or another, and those are called ischemic strokes. Mm, Ischemic, right? Yeah, ischemic. And uh, that means that they're just, uh, for for, uh, whatever reason, again, uh, for a short period of time, there's lack of blood flow to the brain tissue, and if that lack of blood flow goes on too long, then the uh, brain tissue itself is going to start to die, mm-hmm. and uh, that w- that can lead to a stroke. Um, and we, everybody knows, kind yeah. of, you know, everybody's had, you know, an uncle or a grandfather or a grandmother who's had a stroke. Yeah, and interesting, I think that- interesting you say that, because just in the last few weeks, and certainly ever since we started doing the show, there are a lot of people out there that are confused about the difference between a stroke and a heart attack. Oh yeah, and you know that that sometimes you can have lots of heart attacks. Uh, you don't want to have too many strokes, right? So, so I would imagine that a stroke, in many respects, is a great wake up call. So, my question to you, as a vascular surgeon, at what point in time are usually guys like you pulled into a case where somebody's got a stroke, and some of it may be because they need to be corrected in your field? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's usually uh, so. Part of the process is to find out you know why it's why did this happen you mm-hmm. know why for instance if somebody has a stroke uh well the first question is is it an ischemic stroke is it due to a lack of blood flow mm-hmm. or is it something that we call lack of blood flow which is from the carotid artery into your brain yes yep. um or is it what something that we call a hemorrhagic stroke mm-hmm. now that's uh that's a stroke that occurs because somebody bleeds into yeah, the brain yeah. and i think that's something that a lot of people have heard of too because it's a fairly common event uh, so that's the first question. Now, if it's a hemorrhagic uh, a stroke, do vascular surgeons typically get involved with that? Well, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's an ischemic stroke, uh, do vascular surgeons get involved with that? Yeah, definitely all the time, especially yeah. if it has to do with uh, carotid arteries and the lack of blood flow. You'd be amazed at how many people the thought was that it's the same place. Uh, stroke happens in the brain. Right. And, and a heart attack happens in the heart. In the heart, you know, yeah. So it, it's a few feet away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but you're right. A lot of people confuse yeah, those yeah, two yeah. things. Um, but that's what it boils down yeah. to. It boils down. It, it, the process yeah. is the same. It's a lack of blood flow to a you know a certain amount of tissue of either the heart or the brain. Mm-hmm. But it's, yeah, it's either one or the other. And if it's the heart, it's a myocardial infarction. If it's the brain, it's a stroke. Do they have, I mean, obviously, um, once you've had a stroke, 
you're probably more at risk to have an additional stroke. The long, the longer in your life you go without having a stroke, the less likely it is a stroke's going to get you. It might be something else that's going to get you. Yeah. Um, I, I think conversely, that's, that's definitely true. If you, if you have one event, then the likelihood yeah. of you having yeah. another event is quite high, especially if, if the, you know, the root cause is not addressed. Mm-hmm. Sure. There so, you go. Or so, dealt with by a surgery or, or whatever. Some of the other things you can do. Are, right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Now. So, you know, when we talk about blood flow through carotid arteries, the, the, the thing that interrupts blood flow is placking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've talked about placking before. Um, and it's a process uh, where there is a buildup of fatty tissue, cholesterol, you know, calcium, all this sort of stuff that happens within the lining of the artery. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, it's, all, it's often referred to as hardening of the arteries sure, because yeah. that, these plaques actually can be very, very hard because uh, they do contain a fair amount of calcium. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see arterial plaques to be you know nearly as hard as bone i mean that can happen when we take a look at um, the veins once again um you can have lots of plaque you can have lots of clots you can be a real a real problem um is that same true of the arteries can you have a a lot of different parts of your arteries affected yes um but just to just to fine tune that comment a little bit uh typically in veins placking is not the problem Mm mm-hmm now, in arteries, yeah, gotcha, placking gotcha. is often yeah, the problem. Yeah. Uh, but in veins, um, now, but, you know, blood clot can occur in either situation. You know, if a vein is, is not functioning well, uh, you know, DVT can happen. Mm. Uh, if an artery is not functioning well, you know, blood clot can form. Uh, but uh, typically, placking has more to do with arterial disease. Venous insufficiency is more due to a, a disruption of the valve function that we've talked about. Okay, you know, and, and my thing here is, gang, is I'm like you. So if you have a question that, never, that doesn't seem to be getting answered, uh, you have a couple of options. Uh, you can drop me an email or you can just go to Vein Clinics of Hawaii in the Contact Us bar and say what you'd like to hear on the radio. And maybe you'd want somebody to even call you back. Feel free to leave a, an email address or a phone number there and somebody will get back to you pretty interestingly, uh, pretty quickly. Interestingly enough, my next point was going to be this. I get it with the veins because the veins are pushing that all that blood back up into your uh, to get filtered, to get clean, and then back into your heart, and then back into your body, but it's it's one way out of the out of the artery. So, how would a clot or a or plaque in the artery ever affect my brain? Because you would think it's going away from my brain, unless it's the carotid artery and it's going into my brain. That's a very good question. Yeah, <laughs> see, I think all night about these. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, we, we're going to talk about yeah. that. Yeah, there's a variety of different ways uh, that uh, that that can happen. You know, it's like I said, it's an alteration of blood flow, um, and there's a, a few different ways that that can happen. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, let me uh, make one point mm-hmm. because there's a few little fun facts about carotid disease that I think is important. And um, with respect to stroke. 80 percent of all strokes occur in people who were not did not previously have symptoms. You know, well, that's a high number. To that, yeah. yeah. So surprise, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you are. Yeah, and you know, and in many cases, a stroke can be devastating. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, uh, talk about life altering. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so then the question is, you know, and we'll get to this a little later too. Uh, we have to sometimes we sh- we need to screen for patients mm-hmm. who have a problem that may not be symptomatic. In carotid disease and stroke is one of those things. Oh, wow. so we yeah. have to kind of pick out the people who we think are most likely to possibly have carotid disease, and then do something to follow, you know screen them, follow them, etc. Seventy five percent of strokes are ischemic. Like we said before, that's due to a lack of blood flow. Mm-hmm. Um, 75% of ischemic strokes are due to carotid artery disease. So oh there's a pretty n- fair number of strokes mm-hmm. overall that are due to uh, a problem with the artery. Um, and when, we, when we're looking at that, the, the likelihood of somebody having a stroke uh, and st- trying to relate it to the amount of blockage that might be there... We look at statistics. Now, a 75% uh, blockage, we, we call that a stenosis. Mm-hmm. If somebody has a 75% blockage, then they have about a 25, 26% likelihood 
that they're going to have a stroke over a period of three years. Yeah. That's concerning. Yeah, that's, yeah and that's kind of sco- – Let, let me ask scary. you this. I know this one guy, a very busy professional, um, was in a big box place. On the way out to the car, he, uh, he, buy, he bought the, uh, the hot dog and the drink, got in his car, driving away. Next thing he remembers, he's in the hospital. He had a stroke. Um, recovered. He's back to business. I mean, everything's back to normal. And uh, the only thing he doesn't do anymore is buy fast food because he thinks that was the – and it could have been. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, isn't it, isn't it interesting how these things, other than vascular disease, you can see it coming along once you're a patient. Whether it's getting worse or better, you can see it. But some of these things that you're talking about here, they just literally come out of the blue. They can, yeah, yeah. and that, and that's why yeah. uh, that's why I mentioned the fact that uh, you know eighty percent of people with strokes that's the first symptom of stroke. You know? <laughs> so they get one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They get it. Yeah. Uh, now there are warning signs. That gentleman was very very lucky mm-hmm. because he had a he had a sign and apparently yeah. he recovered completely right, from right, what yeah. it was. Um, and we're going to talk about that specific situation. Yeah, but in he just went a minute. from he went from driving his car to being in the hospital. Yeah, he had a a memory lap. I mean, he, right. he cracked up his car. Yeah, you know, and so uh, the first thing he said, he asked, "Is it, it, is my hamburger here?" Because he, he was eating hamburger. <laughs> yeah, it was two hours. Go? It was two hours. Yeah, that he was out of commission. Okay, but, so yeah. he a uh, loss of consciousness. Yeah, for yeah. you know one reason or another, and, and certainly confused. Yeah. yeah. Um. And did he have any neurologic kind of things like weakness, numbness? You know, was he weak on one side or anything? Not, like, nothing not, like that. They did identify some things afterwards, mm-hmm. and it apparently the doctor said you've been suffering these for a long time, but you've been gradually accepting them, right? Not knowing how bad they could have been, and since it was a little tingle here and a little zippity up. There, yeah, no big deal. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's just it, and that's why I want to talk about some of those things. Um, and we'll do that in a yeah. minute. But those are the types of symptoms that people should not be ignoring. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have that kind of stuff, you know, if you have uh, a little bit of numbness in your arm yeah. that goes away uh, after a while, that's something that you need to to be aware yeah, of yeah. and uh, take heed and, and look yeah. into it. Um, but, uh, so who are the people that we should screen? We, we mentioned screening, you know, who are those people mm-hmm. that are maybe you know, at risk, very, yeah, 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 at yeah, higher, yeah, yeah. a little higher risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can't screen everybody. Uh, so we have to uh, figure out what those, uh, criteria are that we should use to uh, screen people. One of them is something that we call a brewery. And a brewery is, uh, something that we hear in the neck um when you know you you, you go to your doctor mm-hmm. you, you get a yearly checkup or yeah. whatever and hopefully more often than that as we age yeah, yeah. yeah. and um you know the doctor's going to listen to your lungs mm-hmm. with his stethoscope he's going to listen to your heart with his stethoscope well the other thing that he very likely will do is listen to your neck with a stethoscope oh, okay and um if he's if your doctor's not doing that he should let him know yeah. um but uh what what you can do with a stethoscope if somebody has a plaque uh or some sort of narrowing of the carotid artery um Act, activity is good no activity is not so good what? when you when you put the stethoscope there yeah no no <laughs> yeah. actually activity is bad oh okay whoops so okay. um and that's what a brewy is oh, what, okay, what okay. happens is I that the blood going through that that blockage in the artery creates turbulence in mm-hmm. the, in the blood flow and you can actually hear that you know with a stethoscope wow. on your neck yeah so if uh, if a you know if a physician or if that is identified uh, during in the course of a, a physical examination, that's something that needs to be you know paid attention sure. to, and we would screen for that. Typically, screening is to do an ultrasound. Uh, patients who have a very strong family history of stroke or even vascular disease, sure, um, yeah. of any type. Though family history, you know, maybe yeah. they haven't had anything yet, but if, you know, both their parents and grandparents, if they all had vascular disease in one way or another, those people should probably be screened, and, uh, not only for carotid disease, but for some other things, too. Yeah, and I get that. And that's why, gang, many times on the program, we walk through that particular phase of life where you you have to be aware of some of the things that are going on, particularly if with regards to vascular disease, vein disease. Um, if it's right in your family, if mom or grandma had it, you're going to get it. I mean, mm-hmm. some form of it. Um, I often say, thanks, mom. I love you, but I could have done without this one. Yeah. But, it, but in actual fact, I think it's very beneficial 
for people to know their fam- their medical family history. And this could be a, a little jogging right now for those of you to ask your aunties and uncles what they can tell you before it's anecdotal stuff that gets lost. Because who keeps a record? Mm-hmm. Right. I don't have a sick file at my house. Right. Probably right. should. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, family history of medical problems in whatever way, whether yeah, they're vascular yeah. or not. Um, you know, that's important information that uh, your health care provider uses to uh, treat to, and to screen and to just follow you over time. Um, another group of people that we would be more apt to screen are those people with other diseases that are related to vascular disease of any type, mm-hmm. you know, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, that type of stuff, yeah. um, or, or those people who have, you know, other forms of vascular disease. Let's say they have, you know, the vas- let's say they've had a heart attack, you know, let's mm-hmm. say they have coronary yeah, yeah, disease. Yeah. Well, those people should be screened uh, for sure, definitely, because yeah. there's a very close correlation between those two things happening at the same time. What is kind of interesting to me, and that's one of the things we call forward on the show all the time, uh, go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com, by the way, to see the length and breadth of some of the other things that go on there. But I think what you really need to do is admit um, that you, you have to have a bird's eye view. And, and going to a doctor every couple of years just because you think it's a good idea, it's like the dentist. If you don't go for a while, they pull your teeth. Well, you, you don't necessarily pull body parts but it gets to the point where the parts aren't working so well anymore and they could have been that could have been caught at an at an earlier uh you know examination right yeah. uh yeah and we we hear that all the time i mean mm-hmm. you know uh, people who will you know some of these symptoms of uh, especially venous disease but vascular disease also uh they can come on yeah. so slowly and over such a long period of time that you, people just get accustomed to having them and they think it's you know yeah. par for the course because i'm getting older yeah. or whatever well I, the other side of that is and we've covered this before and i'm sure going to cover it again a little bit here in a minute and that is that there is any culmination of bad things going on in your body it, I mean, all you have to do is take a look at the specialists in medicine and find out there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. And so there's oh, yeah. all of this coordination. And as we age, there is no getting around the fact that you need to have your both feet on the ground to find out what's the matter with you when you can understand it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if you get too old and you're just going to get somebody handing you meds all day, that's not a very good quality of life, is it? No, yeah. no. Yeah, it's, it's with, with, when it comes to your health, it pays to be proactive. There's no question about that. So some of the other risk factors, we mentioned a few, you know, high blood pressure, uh, tobacco use. I mean, you know, there's there's so much that is... Thank goodness uh, that's going down dramatically. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is going down, but it's still, you know, people yeah. still, some people still smoke. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it's, we just have so much information about how smoking is bad for you in so many ways that if there's if there's any one thing mm. that would change the, the health profile of this country in general, mm. it would be yeah. smoking. So if you got two people, twins, one smokes like a chimney, one doesn't, the, uh, the smoker is going to go a lot quicker. In all probability. In all probability. Yeah, 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 yeah. You always hear the, those stories yeah, about, yeah. oh, my grandfather lived till 100 and Smoked whatever. four cigars a day and drank yeah, whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's, yeah. not, that's not the typical. But tobacco but, use in general. I mean, I yeah. remember fighting tooth and nail when back in the days that when I smoked it, thinking, oh, all of these little messages they put on the packages and all of that stuff, that's yeah. just, you know, forget about it. Right. That's not me. And then you see people just like you saying, "Oh yeah, he's got throat cancer." Oops. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. that's when it yeah. That, that, yeah. that's when it starts to sink in when you see your peers having those kind of problems. And, and then, then of course, here and I noticed this was the next thing on your list here in Hawaii. I think for whatever the reason, I think it goes way back to World War II, and a lot of the things that we ate weren't available, so they start coming in in cans, and the cans are full of sugar and full of salt. So we, and particularly as the Polynesian races, we just. Loved all of that stuff and ate all of that stuff and they're paying for all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that must be a very, very worrisome because you can't often see somebody, whether they're diabetic or not, but once you examine them, you can pretty much figure it out. Yeah, well, yeah. In, in, you know, blood tests and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, the di- I mean, diet is, is so important, too. I mean, we talk about smoke, stopping smoking is, is yeah. utterly important, but you know, the, the construction of your diet and adhering to healthy, you know, dietary uh, rules is uh, tremendously important, too, because, yeah, 
uh, you know, diabetes. We eat too many bad things. And it's it's the entire country. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, I mean, yeah, the the state of Hawaii uh, has its own, uh, you know, health issues as it pertains to the diet. But it is similar. Similar mm-hmm. things can be said about the whole country. And, um, you know, it's just poor diet. And also lack of activity, I think, that has really uh, you know, been a de- determinant for the uh, general health profile across the country. But diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, we mentioned family history, we mentioned obesity, um, all of these things can be uh, risk factors for not only carotid disease, but vascular disease in general. We do know that uh, sleep apnea has its issues with regards to um, stroke and, and all of that stuff. But what, what, are, what are other reasons why sleep apnea is a problem? I mean, you know, actually you're starting and stopping not getting a night's sleep. That's a big problem. But what, what are the other issues with regards to maybe your circulatory system, maybe your, you know, your, the, the arteries and veins? Yeah, well, you know, what, those, those details I'm not real familiar with. But, um, yeah, sleep apnea is uh, connected with stroke. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not not in as strong of a way as some of these other risk factors, but it probably has to do with, uh, you know, the oxygen content mm-hmm. of the arterial blood flow and the vascular reactivity. I mean, when when oxygen gets too low, then the blood va- blood vessels tend to, uh, you know, be become either uh, you know constricted or uh, the blood flow mm-hmm. is affected. Um, and uh, so often that can lead to a higher risk of stroke in the future, especially if you have these other things. Going okay, on. what 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 is that little deal that they put on your finger? When usually when you're getting your blood pressure checked, they put that thing on your finger. It's for oxygen, right? W- what does it mean? What's that for? That's that's an indicator. It's not really the full story, but it's an indicator of how well your blood is carrying oxygen. Okay. So, which is what blood does, yeah, you know, yeah, which yeah. red blood cells. That's carry. its job. Yeah, that's yeah. its job, yeah, yeah. to carry oxygen. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, uh, like I said, there there's a number of different components right. of how oxygen is carried in red blood cells, but uh, the uh, we call that O2 saturation. Okay, so, I mean, when you get into the, say, middle or upper 90s, you're pretty much average, pretty much okay. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, I was 100 one time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Take You're a good. picture of that. I want to keep that. <laughs> but but seriously, I think that I, I actually am feeling a lot more confident that since I've been more active lately, since we've been redoing the show and 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 having my own issues with uh, sciatica, I, I I become so many so much more aware of like the other day I'm up at my at the clinic and you see people getting out of the cars and I mean we have a lot of people that are walking on this or getting the ride in that or mm-hmm. obviously having pain and discomfort. Now, obviously, you see these people at the facility because that's what they're going there for. Yeah. But now you see it just in general. Right. It's just on the street you see people. Gee, that poor lady or that poor guy having such a tough time. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like we said, a lot of that, you know, could have been prevented. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, had, you know, alternate kind of lifestyles yeah. and whatever been uh, taken. So getting back to... The signs and symptoms we we were talking about this a little bit before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what are the what are the signs of um, carotid disease? Uh, you know and stroke that maybe you you might be having that you should absolutely pay attention to. Mm-hmm. And there's something called amaurosis fugax. And amaurosis. It sounds like a new brand of beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that would be a good name for a beer. Uh, Amaurosis fugax means um, that you have a transient loss of vision okay. in one eye that lasts a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, Heaven knows there's a lot of stuff going on in your eyes. Right? You, yeah, yeah, well, mm-hmm. in, uh, the important feature here mm-hmm. is that the, the main artery that goes, yeah. that's going to your eyeball is uh you know ultimately a branch uh, off of the carotid arteries mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so uh a, a, you know bad a bad vascular effects that might be originating in the carotid arteries in your neck may be affecting the uh what's called the retinal artery the okay. artery going to the eye so uh there are situations where uh disease again plaque in the neck and little pieces of that plaque and you know, calcium or whatever break loose 
go up into the eye. Mm-hmm. And luckily, most of the time, uh, there it's a transient blindness. And, uh, you know, usually the uh, the textbooks talk about a, a screen coming down over the eye. That's mm-hmm. what people kind of experience. Um, and uh, they can, you know, lose their vision or their vision can be impaired to one extent or another for a uh, just a short period of time. You must know, be very. It, it might be minutes. You it know. must be for some pretty scary a period of time. I'll be slow. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's it's amazing over the years. Uh, you know, talking to people, it's amazing the number of people who might ignore something like mm-hmm. that and say, "Well, you know, yeah, it happened, but it went away." So yeah. I, you know, didn't I was think tired. It. I was tired. And yeah. um, so that that transient loss of vision is what we would refer to as a a sentinel sign of potential stroke. Definitely something that you need Mm -hmm. to look into. Okay, so now as you you compile these lists, which we hope you're doing, uh, some of them, uh, it's just FYI. Um, there are other ways, though. There are there are other symptoms of some of the other stuff. So when you when you're doing that, uh, when you're taking a look, um, obviously there there's something that can be addressed in every single case. So people shouldn't panicky if they get no. one of these symptoms and they say, "Oh, whoa, it's me. This is it. I'm done." Yeah, no, no, the, no need for that. Yeah, yeah. No need for that. It's just you know, it's it's something that you need to pay attention to. And, uh, you know, ask your doctor about or whatever and then go from there. But uh, so there's there's uh, the next kind of level of, of symptoms that you might have is something called a transient ischemic attack or something that we call a TIA. Many people have yeah, heard I've seen that, that TIA, term, yeah. TIA. Now, what is a TIA? Well, <clears throat> uh, amaurosis fugax is sort of a transient ischemic attack of the eye, you know, the retina. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, a TIA in general can be uh, short-lived, transient um, numbness of an extremity or weakness, you know, a little bit yeah. of weakness in your hand. I've always, when you say numbness, I've always been um, puzzled at what causes numbness. For instance, if you lie in bed at night and you're reading and you lie on that arm for a while, when you wake up, it's like numb. Because you virtually must have cut off circulation part of that arm. Um, so it, it would imagine if you permanently mm-hmm. uh, shut that off, you got a big issue. Well, yeah, um, it, you would. Yeah. Uh, but um, So the numbness. The, is, n- the numbness in this scenario, yeah. you know, a TIA from potential stroke, it's a little different mechanism. Okay. Yeah, okay. When, you, when you lay on your arm, you know, in a weird way. Um, you know, you're you're doing something locally to the mm-hmm. arm, either the vasculature or the or the nerves, um, and then you know, then you move and it sure. all comes back. Uh, but this is uh, this is related to a short lived lack of blood flow to a part of the brain mm, that is okay. controlling or affecting that part that of your part body. of your body. Sure. Yeah. So you know, we we often hear you know the again the classic story is you know somebody you know, was just sitting around and yeah. went to pick up a coffee cup or whatever and, you know, picked, tried to pick it up and it fell, you mm-hmm. know, or they tried to do, you know, some, some other, you know, mechanical yeah. kind of thing and they're not able to do that. Or they For feel, me, one day I was putting the key in the door. Darn thing wouldn't fit in the hole. I said, what's the matter with this thing? Got to make the hole bigger. I go get a drill. <laughs> but it, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's, I, I get it, yeah. you know, and it... Uh, it, it it sometimes can be you're just so concentrating on something else, mm-hmm. something that you do in and out every day. You're just not you don't do it right for a change. Yeah, well, but isn't isn't what you talk about important? I mean, if you have regular numbness or tingling, it's trying to tell you something. Well, yeah. well especially if it's it, if it comes and goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there, you know, you can have numbness and <clears throat> other problems for you know related to other disease processes, uh, but something that happens suddenly. And then resolves, mm-hmm. and especially if it happens a second time, that is a, that's a little bit more alarming. Uh, you know, the other thing that people might see in this scenario is slurred speech. Oh, now, okay. I, I think yeah. that a lot of people are familiar with slurred speech being a part of stroke. You know, sure. Um, well, they got or, a great campaign now. You've seen that fast F A S T. Yes, that's great. Great, good yeah. to know about face. Right. right. Yeah. 
um, and uh, it, it, facial drooping right. is the yeah, other thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you see those things, and, and yeah, it, that, uh, you know, those uh, media reports uh, about the signs of stroke, that's exactly yeah, what we're yeah. talking about, have been good. I mean, I think that's a very, very good thing for people to, you know, become aware of. And, you know, they say, you know, take an aspirin, yeah. go to the ER, that kind of thing. And, the thing I love about this, Doc, and I'm sure you do too, is that it actually does give people a lot of hope. You know, I mean, what they hear about these things, they learn them once it sinks in and they and they own them as their own memory or their own knowledge. Um, you can you can see it coming a little, especially right now because of the, the stroke stuff you're talking about. But even um, things that are just not not a sign of somebody else having a stroke, because that's easier to see than your own. Sure. You know? But just knowing how to do that or what to go through must be very relieving for an awful lot of people, especially yeah. as we get older. Right. Yeah, and and we've we've talked about that before. You know, the ninety percent of it is uh, recognizing the problem, and uh, you know, making it uh, making it real for yourself, so that you can then go yeah. and find a resolution. And you know, there's another uh, school of thought uh, that that sometimes they say that when they listen to the program, they don't talk, they don't hear about us talking about meds too much, um, only because. Most of the time, we're talking about a varicose vein is kind of past the time that it has a med. You have to do something about it. Mm-hmm. But isn't there also a reason to be able to control certain things if you are supposed to be medita- meditating yourself to actually be doing it religiously? Sure. You know, not, yeah. not saying, well, I feel pretty good. I'm not going to take this today. Right. Yeah. yeah, especially as it relates to arterial you know, vascular sure. disease. Yeah. Um, but, is that, uh, by the way, Doc, is that a takeaway from when somebody's had a stroke? Isn't there always a parting gift of a bag of meds that you're going to start taking? Uh, may or may not. Mm. I mean, it depends on, you know, the uh, other things that are going on with yeah. that particular patient. But, you know, might might somebody have a couple of medications mm, yeah. introduced? Definitely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Um you know, uh, control, you know, high, high blood pressure, for instance. Mm-hmm, sure. I mean, they don't call it the silent killer for yeah, nothing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, those uh, those types of things need to be followed and, you know, medications need to be taken for it. Diabetes is another mm-hmm. one. you got to control sure. your diabetes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, most of us, by the way, don't get it. Um, I, I often tell this to people years ago when I was diagnosed as being a type 2 diabetic. Uh, getting a hold of that and doing what, what I was told, it was like 30 days before it went away. Can you imagine that? Something that you, you, you probably build on for years yeah. and it can make an immediate go away if you do the right thing to it. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. Which in my case was knocking way down on sugar and salt. Mm-hmm. Boom. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is the typical local way of eating, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, and weight loss too. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you know that that had, that uh, impacts diabetes hugely. But uh, so we uh, we we mentioned before um, how does how does a blockage in the in in an artery in your neck affect blood flow to the brain? You know what? I think that's really important. Let's get let's get in touch with that. You're listening to our uh, Vein Clinics of Hawaii show, and you can get more information on the web at www.veinclinicshawaii.com, uh, and you can also uh, give us a call or, or uh, at. Or write me, drop me an email, and I'll get I'll get whatever your concern is on the show, the Mike Buck Show at gmail.com. Spring into summer by looking younger. Call Vein Clinics of Hawaii to schedule your free consultation today. Facial and body rejuvenation procedures are designed to help you look and feel your best without breaking your budget. Reduce pigmentation, fine lines, wrinkles, scarring, and stretch marks with minimal invasiveness or side effects. Confused about which procedure is right for you? Call 427-5565 to schedule an appointment or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Tired of dealing with vein disease? Have your symptoms gotten worse? Oh, these spider veins are ugly. My legs and ankles are always swollen. My legs are tired of standing all day. While some symptoms can be managed by lifestyle changes, other factors are out of your control. Get help from the experts at Vein Clinics of Hawaii. To learn more about your treatment options, call 427-5565 or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. You have lots of stuff going on. And friendly staff, great people in all four branches. Once again, a reminder that Vein Clinics of Hawaii are on the Big Island and in uh, on Maui, on Kauai, and here in Honolulu. Um, Dr. Julef and I, we do this show, 
and it's Vane Clinics uh, of Hawaii on the air. And we try to cover just about everything, but every now and again we're going to miss up. So don't don't feel bad about making a suggestion. And I do know that somebody can have a a tiny little thing that they're that they're bugged about, and they're just not they're tenacious like a a pit bull. And isn't it now easier to get information? I mean, you know, just oh, yeah. just in your clinics alone, look at how many people just call up and say, you know, I heard it on the radio, or saw you on TV, or saw an ad. Um, it might be me. How do we check? Sure. And uh, and on our website, there's a uh, there's a place for people to go. Uh, having to do specifically with this radio show, mm-hmm. so uh, they can uh, look for the uh, the icon having to do with that. Click on that, and then you send can us, even listen to some of the shows. S- yeah. Send us uh, mm-hmm. send us questions. Yeah, you bet. We would love to hear questions from everyone. Yeah, and the more the merrier. And by the way, I did learn early in the piece. Um, Doctor Julep told me day one there is no dumb question. We just don't. They're not dumb. They're just misinformed <laughs> before. But yeah. but but uh, what I'm pleased about is the takeaway that's satisfied. We've, we've had the opportunity since we started doing the show to talk with some very, very pleased clients, um, that people that really, uh, they kind of got to you in, in sort of a last resort in some of these folks. Some of these folks have been suffering for an awful long time, and once you got them into a treatment program and some procedures, they are as back to as normal as you can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Which is it, very, that's got to be the fun part of what you do. Oh, it is. Yeah, the the rewarding part is that, and and you know, usually those are the people with the more more complicated kind of problems. Um, but uh, yeah, it's so rewarding yeah. to be able to have them come in. We evaluate them, we treat them, and we try to make things as good as we possibly can for them. And it impacts their quality of life tremendously. How do you decide when? Uh, Treatment is indicated and necessary, and you need to work with the patient to start grabbing a hold of how important a particular thing is that they get addressed. Uh, well, we, um, you know, we, we go through our usual evaluation, um, and uh, it's a little different for, for everything. Um, but, um, you know, by the way, with respect to uh, vascular problems, in, in especially carotid disease, um, we uh, were capable of, uh, although you know we're called Vein Clinics of Hawaii, we uh, we evaluate arterial problems mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. So if anybody listening to the program, especially today, if they have questions about you know carotid disease, uh, and uh, gee, yeah, I've had some of these symptoms. Do I need to be worried, et cetera, et cetera? Please give give us a call because. We can definitely uh, evaluate and uh, make decisions about how things should be treated. Uh, I, d- I did arterial, you know, surgery yeah, yeah, for many, yeah. many years. So, uh, but, but I mean, it, it, it totally stands to reason. And I think that people, once again, when we first started, uh, were ex- exchanging uh, the differences between the the arteries and the veins. Uh, and they are, I guess, if if you would take a look at anything else in your body. They are the things that work hand in hand more than anything. Yeah, you know, sure. It, it's uh, sort of like, said, do you want circulation or not? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how does uh, getting back to the carotid artery? How, how does the carotid artery um, cause stroke? And again, it, we call it carotid uh, mm-hmm. disease causes about twenty percent of all strokes. Um, and it, it, it's an alteration of blood flow in one way or another. Now, there's several ways that ca- that can happen. Um, the first is just uh, as the plaque gets larger and larger, as the blockage gets larger and larger, there is, of course, a diminished amount of flow going through that artery. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, at some point, it becomes uh, significant, and uh, people you know, might have symptoms related to just the lack of blood flow going through the carotid artery itself. Uh, but that's, that's, usually, that's the least likely way that uh, people will actually end up having a stroke. And um, surprisingly, and we see this not infrequently, people, people can develop plaques in the uh, carotid artery that uh, become very, very significant and at some point even occlude the artery. And they may not have a symptom or have a stroke or anything. I mean, it's always been 
a uh, an amazing thing to me. Now, the reason for that is because uh, we've got, uh, you know, the carotid arteries are on both sides of the neck and mm-hmm. therefore both sides of the brain. There are other arteries that uh, are, are, you know, taking blood to the brain. Wait, wait, wait. That's another one. And I'm glad you explained that because the people that I thought had you had one carotid artery. Yeah, no. And you have two. Two, yeah, yeah. one on each one, side. One each side of the brain. And yeah. the uh, and the blood from one side of the brain actually can kind of, you know, go from one side to the other. So the, uh, you know, the brain, since it is such an important yeah, yeah. organ, you know, the uh, there are, there's a buffer uh, with respect to the amount of blood flow. So we actually see people who have a, an occluded carotid artery and they're doing fine yeah. and those are people that we don't do anything to we you know, do we uh, do we need to operate on those people no because they're mm-hmm. stable i mean that's uh the blockage has occurred and they're stable so we uh, we just sort of ignore it you know that's another thing and i, I want to make sure that people understand that um when you have an ultrasound treatment at dr julep's office um it's kept and and what you see is uh, sometimes you'll, you'll be concerned about something and they'll be like, well, last year's it was the same size in the same place. So obviously this hasn't become a problem. And I'm thinking that because unlike maybe some other conditions, um, venous disease comes on a lot slower than others. Mm-hmm. So you can actually be pretty certain that there's some things going on, say, for instance, in my body that might panic some people, but they're not an issue. You know, they're, they're, they're acting, they're contained, they're mm-hmm. within themselves and they don't pose another problem. But it it seems that, and it takes a longer time. Sooner or later, it sounds like it will. Mm-hmm. But but you have the ability, don't you, to just say, "All right, well, look, uh, last year it was this way. This year it's that way. Yeah, it's, it's time to address it." Oh, definitely. Yeah, it, it, we, and we do we do a lot of that. Yeah. you know, and that's part of the screening uh, ultrasound. I mean, if we uh, if we do a screening ultrasound on. Uh, a patient's carotid yeah. artery, we, we may find that they have, you know, minimal to moderate amount of plaque. Sure. Um, that's not completely normal. So we might say to them, hey, in another six months or another yeah, year, yeah. you need to come back. We need to make sure it's not progressing more. Um, the other way that stroke happens is with uh, what's referred to as a ruptured plaque. Uh, the plaque itself can become friable and actually break break or crack and pieces of that plaque it's not necessarily a lack of blood flow through mm-hmm. the carotid artery itself but mm-hmm. a little piece of plaque can break loose go through the circulation and then yeah. go into the brain and create a lack of blood flow in a specific section of the brain and then that can lead to a stroke i'm going to guess that the brain being this all hungry thing mm-hmm. needs a constant supply of these nutrients like oh, yeah. 20, even when you're sleeping and and uh so obviously anything that's constricted needs to be looked at how how do you do that i mean you know uh, my brain's perfectly okay but this this artery going up to it's got some some issues how do we fix it yeah well um the uh well how do we diagnose it exactly first yeah. um uh, you know for with respect to screening and we've mentioned screening now a few times uh typically the way that we do that is with ultrasound i mean mm-hmm. it's very it's yeah. quick it's easy it's non-invasive and uh it's a, a very very accurate way to determine the percentage of blockage because that's what we want to know we want to know how you know what percentage of blockage are we dealing with so um if we're screening we use ultrasound. Now, what if we are doing a, an evaluation with the question of does this patient need uh, interventional therapy of one sort or another? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes an ultrasound, we do an ultrasound. Sometimes that's enough. If, there, if that, yeah, if yeah, that yeah. ultrasound gives us enough, in, enough information that we need to know right at that moment to make a decision to either do surgery or do some sort yeah. of interventional, then sometimes that's all we do is an ultrasound. Uh, I, by the way, I was talking with uh, uh, one of the technicians, the ultrasound technician, Michael. Really good young guy, uh, really knows. It's like he's an artist with that thing, right? He's pretty yeah, good. He's good. Uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I've, I've seen you employ, and I've heard that you employ the use of the ultrasound even while during surgery. Oh, it's, yeah. it's not just something that gives you an indication. It's somebody that creates a pathway for you to walk down when you're doing your surgery. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. we, we uh, especially with the vein stuff, yeah, yeah, we use the ultrasound extensively to... Um, you know, uh, identify where we need to go mm-hmm. and how the placement of the devices that we use and all that. Yeah, it's the ultrasound. Is, it's a tremendous uh, benefit. Here's the thing. Answer me. I, first of all, as a patient, 
I feel so stoked because I can see the thing. And what you do is you're looking at a very small part of the leg or the head or the chest or whatever. And when you look at these, so the actual uh, canals that you're looking to put your wire through when you're doing your treatment, Mm -hmm. they're very small. But on the ultrasound, they look a little bit bigger. So yeah. it must give you a little wiggle room when you're actually doing the surgery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To know where the walls yeah, are. It's yeah. like a magnifying glass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really? If, yeah. if, you, uh, if we need to magnify the view, yeah, we can. We yeah. have that, uh, you know, it's got that uh, capability, which sometimes it comes in handy. Yeah. Yeah. Super. It's really super. Yeah. yeah. So if we want to, if we, if we need to do something further, um, we, there's a good, several different, uh, you know, variations of angiography that we, we can do. Uh, CT angiogram is one that we commonly do to, uh, evaluate not only the carotid arteries, but also, and in particular, if there's a reason to think that it, the stroke may have been done due to a vascular problem mm-hmm. in, in the brain. Yeah as opposed to in the carotid artery, um, then uh, we often will want more yeah. information than what an ultrasound is going to give us. So we often look to CT angiography. How does a brain surgeon rely on the work of a vascular surgeon or the technology that you're using? Well, we're we're using some of the same diagnostic devices, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. sure. Um, but I mean, what I'm getting at is the patient might have a long history mm-hmm. of dealing with venous situations, and then that same patient is now dealing with, you know, a brain, a tumor, or something else. Mm-hmm. There must be some very valuable uh, case casework to look at from that patient. Yeah, there there's some there's some crossover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no yeah, question yeah. between vascular surgery and neurosurgery, depending on what what the problem is. Uh, but uh, because yeah, a lot of the things that they do are also vascularly related. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes we kind of have to to work hand in hand. Um, and then we also will might you know periodically do standard angiography, and by that I mean yeah. you know the procedure where you have to go in through the groin artery and th- you know move, uh, thread a catheter up into the mm-hmm. carotid wow. arteries and uh, Makes, you that. make it sound so simple. Yeah, <laughs> thread an old catheter. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, and I see this by the way, um, and it's it's so relieving to know because since I've been doing this program, I know that. I don't have to be as shocked as, as some people are in, in where they are. But I do know that when you take a look at this, that every now and again you make a decision with a patient is, hey, you know, th- we, it, this may be too late to do surgery on. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, I mean, I'm wondering if when you make that call, how you can make that person still have some quality of life. What can they do? May, maybe are there pills? Are there ointments? Are there preparations? Are there things that, that can help me? Yeah, um, and there are, but you know, hopefully we get to the, those patients before we get to that point. Mm, yeah. uh, but are some people inoperable? Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in any in any uh, in any kind of form of surgery, some people you shouldn't do surgery on. Well, you know, just to give you an example, I was looking at something the other day, and it was um, some doctors that are doing some work on some homeless folks, mm-hmm. and some of these people have horrific conditions. Yeah that are so bad that you can't operate on some other condition because the likelihood of there being, you know, contamination or infection is just way too high. You just can't do it. Right. Yeah. Well, that, and that would be one example. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for us, it's mainly, uh, is this patient uh, medically capable to undergo a general anesthetic yeah, yeah. and, you know, a relatively big operation. And, you know, we're always, we're always making those decisions, but, you know, luckily, uh, you know, medical science has improved things like anesthesia to the point where uh, it's not very often yeah. that we can't. Um, but the, the question is then um, with respect to carotid disease, who should we be operating on? Yeah. And um, there's uh, several different categories. And again, we, we look at this um, uh, ultrasound uh, or the, mm. the ultrasound or the angiogram, and we, we gauge the amount of percentage uh, of the blockage. And then we sort of relate that to the likelihood that they're going to have a problem. Um, and the, the people, the group of people that benefit the most from the procedure that we do yeah. for carotid stenosis are those people with a blockage greater than 70% mm-hmm. and have had some symptom. You know, so if somebody oh, had, okay. yeah. you know, sudden blindness that can be related to their carotid disease and they have a greater than 70% blockage, those people absolutely yeah. need surgery. 
Yep, and there you go. And you can learn more about that by going to veinclinicsofhawaii.com, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. And if you want to make a, an appointment based on what you've heard today, uh, please call. The number is uh, 427-5565, uh, 427-5565. And we'll see you next time uh, for Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Glad you could join us and tell, tell your friends about us. And we'll be back again. Well, that's our program for today, and we certainly hope you enjoyed meeting us. Please come back next week for our next episode. And in the meanwhile, to learn more, please visit our interactive website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com.